Hello, I'm Charles April. This is the second International Spine Injection Society procedure tape. I'm coming to you from Daly City, Seton Medical Center in sunny Northern California. This tape will feature cervical spine injection procedures. Included will be specialty injections into the C1-2 and C2-3 joints, nerve blocks of the third occipital and the medial branches of the cervical spine, cervical facet joint injections, disc injections, and selective epidural injections. These injection procedures are primarily diagnostic. Their purpose is to answer the question, where is the pain coming from? For any structure to be a source of pain, it requires sensory innovation. The zygopophyseal joints and the intervertebral discs have been shown to have appropriate innervation for these structures to be pain sources. This cross-sectional diagram taken from Bogduck demonstrates innervation of both the intervertebral disc and posterior column structures. The intervertebral disc is innervated anteriorly by branches which arise from the vertebral nerve. These branches enter the outer annulus supplying sensory innervation. They also supply innervation to the anterior longitudinal ligament. Branches from the vertebral nerve meet small branches from the segmental nerve to form the sinuvertebral nerve which re-enters the spinal canal and ramifies inside of the uh, spinal canal along the floor. Branches supply the outer disc annulus, the posterior longitudinal ligament, and also the anterior dura and the dural root sleeve so that the investing membranes, the dura and dural root sleeves, have a sensory supply and these structures can be a source of pain. Just distal to the dorsal ganglion, the posterior primary ramus arises to deliver nerves to the posterior column structures, which will be discussed later. The atlantoaxial articulation the C1-2 joint complex consists of a central atlantoaxial joint and two lateral or facet joints. The technique we're going to describe today will be the posterior approach to the lateral C1-2 joint. It would be nice if we could directly visualize these neural structures. Unfortunately, our radiographs demonstrate only the bones and the spaces between the bones. Here you see radiographs of the cervical spine in the frontal and lateral projections supplied by Wolfgang Rauschning. These are cadaver cervical spines and have been positioned for x-ray providing the best possible quality. We see the dens, the C1 lateral masses, the C1-2 joints, C2 body, C3 body with the uncinate processes, C4 body with uncinate processes, the 3-4 disc, 4-5 disc, 5-6 disc space. On lateral view, the anterior C1, ring of C1 posteriorly, the dens, C2 body, C2 articular processes and lamina, spinous process, the 2-3 joint in lateral view, 2-3 disc, and so on, 3-4, 4-5, 5-6, and 6-7. Note that the articular processes at each segment lie slightly above the vertebral body. 3-4-5 vertebral body, C-5 lateral mass, articular process, C-5-6 joint space. This is a prone, open mouth view of the C1-2 articulation. The dens, the C1 lateral masses, the C2 body, and the C2 lateral masses, the C1-2 joint. The target point for injection of the C1-2 joint is here, just lateral to the midpoint. If the joint space is divided into thirds, 
the target is the junction of the middle and lateral third. The approach is from posterior paramedian. A 22 or 25 gauge needle is directed with the fluoroscope down to the posterior surface of inferior C1 or superior C2. The structures at risk are the vertebral artery, which is lateral, the subarachnoid space, which is medial, and most importantly, the dorsal ganglion of C2, which crosses the posterior joint obliquely. Once the needle is directed to the posterior surface of the joint and contacts the ligament, it is advanced through into the joint. The ligament is quite thick. Once the needle is in place in the joint, there is an attempt to aspirate fluid. This is usually possible from 22 gauge needles, but rarely possible through a 25 gauge needle. Contrast material is then instilled and opacifies the joint space. In this instance, one cc of contrast material fills the joint and outlines the large lateral recess, the intact medial recess. Occasionally, fluid will extend through the joint into the medial C12 joint and on occasion to the opposite side. This is a normal phenomenon. As visualized in the lateral plane, we see the dens, the anterior C1, the ring of C1 posterior, the C2 body, the C2 uh, posterior structures. Here you can identify the small gauge needle coming in from posterior, contacting the 1-2 joint surface and entering the joint. Here the lateral view after installation of 1 cc of contrast material. There is no flow into the C1-2 root canal. There is filling of the joint space and in front the triangular meniscoid can be identified. This is the normal appearance of the C12 arthrogram. This is a direct posterior view of the C12 joint complex emphasizing the left sided joint. Needle is now in position one centimeter into the skin directed toward the left sided joint. Needle has now been advanced slightly closer to the joint. It's approaching the mid third and will be advanced directly into the joint. The needle has now been directed into the joint and is ready for injection. In the lateral perspective, the needle is being directed toward the joint. It has contacted the posterior ligament and is now advanced into the joint. We'll now inject a small amount of contrast material into the joint. Here we see the lateral projection demonstrating filling of the left C1-2 joint. The C2-3 joint is of critical importance because of the common association of dysfunction of this joint with cervical headaches. The approach to this joint is deceptively simple if you know the technique. It is very difficult to approach the joint laterally, even though it may appear simple. The key to successful C2-3 joint puncture is a posterolateral approach, which will be demonstrated. The patient is positioned so as to visualize a C2-3 articulation on the right from a posterolateral perspective. Here, is the inferior surface of C2 articular process. Here, the superior surface of C3 articular process between the 2 slash 3 joint space as seen from posterolateral view. The needle is poised in the soft tissues behind the joint, one to two centimeters from the joint surface. In the same perspective, the needle has been advanced forward and has contacted the edge of the articular process and been manipulated into the joint itself. A small volume of contrast material has been instilled and opacifies the joint. The joint in this instance is small 
its articular surfaces are slightly irregular. This injection provoked a profound pain response with complaint of suboccipital pain extending into the right parietotemporal region. In the lateral position, the needle can be seen in place. The joint space is opacified. A small amount of contrast material has uh, leaked into the posterior periarticular tissues through the needle puncture site. Although the joint can be entered from lateral position, it is more effectively punctured from a posterior oblique approach. In the posterior oblique position, the C23 joint can be identified. The needle enters the skin directly posterior to the joint. It is directed vertically onto the posterior lateral surface of the inferior C2 articular process. With minor manipulation, the needle is then directed into the joint. A small amount of contrast material fills the joint. As the fluoroscope moves to a more lateral position, the full opacified C23 joint is visualized. The next topic is blockade of the third occipital nerve and the cervical medial branches. The third occipital nerve crosses the lateral aspect of the C23 joint complex and sends branches to that joint. Each of the lower cervical joints receives its innervation from the cervical medial branches above and below the segment. To successfully block the third occipital nerve, we take a direct lateral approach. To block the cervical medial branches below the 2-3 joint, we can employ a lateral or slightly off-lateral approach. The nerves are in constant position at C3, C4, and C5. The position of the C6 and C7 nerves very slightly. This schematic from Bogdurk demonstrates the left side of the cervical spine from a posterolateral perspective. From above down, we can see the neural elements which innervate posterior column structures. Derived from C2, we see the large greater occipital nerve. Derived from C3, the smaller but still prominent third occipital nerve. Here, running in a groove in the lateral mass of the C3 vertebral body is the posterior ramus of C3, the capsule of the 3 slash 4 joint, the posterior ramus of C4, the capsule of the 4 slash 5 joint, posterior ramus of C5, C6, and C7. Each posterior ramus divides into lateral, intermediate, and medial branches. It is the medial branches which lie in close proximity to the mid portion of the articular processes. Blockade of the third occipital nerve is accomplished by directing a needle onto the lateral surface of the two slash three articular processes at the joint line in the mid point of the joint. Here you see three separate target points for infiltration. The third occipital nerve is fairly large and a small volume of local anesthetic should be delivered to each of these points in order to be certain that this nerve is anesthetized. For this procedure, the patient is lying in a direct lateral position. The fluoroscope is positioned directly over the two, three articular processes and the needle directed in from the lateral side of the neck. Bone is contacted at the mid-joint line. Here the needle is in the position to block the third occipital nerve. This is the middle position. To be complete, a second and third position should be blocked immediately above and below this point. The slow delivery of uh, approximately one cc of local anesthetic 
is effective in blocking the third occipital nerve. An effective block is noted by the appearance of a patch of hypesthesia or numbness roughly three to five centimeters in diameter just over the occipital ridge on the side of the injection. For blockade of the medial branches below the third occipital nerve, the target point is the center of the articular mass. When the patient is positioned for the procedure, the articular process can be seen as a parallelogram. The center of the parallelogram is the target point for infiltration. The patient is in a direct lateral position. The needle is directed onto the lateral surface of the articular process. Contact with bone is established and the needle retracted a millimeter prior to the installation of solutions. For precise blocks, the volume of anesthetic delivered in this position is about one-half to two-thirds of a cc. To effectively block a zygopophyseal joint, it is necessary to infiltrate the medial branch of posterior ramus at the level above and below. Specifically, to block the 4-5 joint requires block of the C4 and C5 medial branches. Here, the spine is seen from the posterior aspect with a steep tilt toward the head. The articular processes can be identified. The waist portion of the articular process is clearly defined in this perspective the medial branch of each posterior ramus lies in this hollow in the waist of the articular pillars. To be certain that the block is complete, it is appropriate to view the spine in this perspective and note the needle position against the articular process. With the subject in the direct lateral position the C23 joint is identified. The needle is then directed down to the joint line. This needle is in position on the lateral aspect of the 23 joint complex. This is the first site for blockade of the third occipital nerve. The second site is slightly inferior, the third site slightly superior. This is a direct lateral view of the cervical spine demonstrating vertebral body in the front and articular processes behind. Note the articular processes are not directly superimposed. It would be difficult to tell the left from the right. By rolling the patient slightly posterior, we can identify the upside articular process here. This is the upside articular process, the one we're interested in in performing our medial branch block. The needle is in position directly over the centroid of the articular process. It is then advanced directly to the bony surface. Once in contact with the lateral surface of the articular process, local anesthetic is infiltrated to complete the block. Arthrography of the cervical zygopophyseal joints can be accomplished by either a posterior or an oblique lateral approach. This tape will describe the oblique lateral approach. The spine is being visualized from the left anterior oblique perspective. Here we see the oblique vertebral body. This is the right-sided pedicle. Here is the elongated left-sided pedicle, the left uncinate process, disc space, uncovertebral recess, left pedicle of the vertebra above. Here we are looking almost directly into the left-sided root canal. 
the floor of the root canal, the superior articular process forming the back of the root canal, the inferior articular process of the vertebra above forming the remainder of the posterior wall of the root canal. By adding a slight caudal tilt, we are now able to clearly visualize the articular processes and the zygopophyseal joint space. In this position, a needle can be directed into the joint, passing behind the neural structures emanating from the root canal. The subject is facing to the right. We are looking down the left-sided root canals with a slight caudal tilt of the tube to visualize the articular processes and the zygopophyseal joint. The needle is poised on the surface above the intended joint under investigation. The needle has been advanced into the joint and contrast material instilled. This is the appearance of about two-thirds of a cc of contrast material. The entire joint space is filled. The capsule appears to be intact. The small superior articular recess is filled and there's excellent visualization of the triangular meniscoid. This is a cross-section axial CT through the C5-6 segment. Here we see the laryngeal apparatus, vertebral body, neural arch structures, superior articular process, inferior articular process, C5-6 joint. The root canal, central canal, multifidus, semispinalis, sternomastoid muscles. The course of a needle directed into the left C5-6 joint will be from the anterolateral aspect of the neck through superficial and deep muscles into the lateral aspect of the Z joint. There are only muscles in the path of the needle from the skin to the joint. The vascular structures are anterior. The neural elements are anterior to the superior process. Vertebral artery is out of harm's way. The approach is safe. This is a second example of an arthrogram seen in the anterolateral perspective. The needle has entered the joint about its midpoint. Here is a superior articular recess with triangular meniscoid, contrast filling the joint space, entering the posterior inferior recess, and in this instance, demonstrating a common, curious normal variant. The contrast has spread from the inferior recess medially behind the ligamentum flavum across to the opposite side, filling the opposite side cervical zygopophyseal joint. This occurs in as many as 25% of normal joint injections if sufficient fluid is instilled into the joint. The contrast passes outside the ligamentum flavum and deep to the fascia of the multifidus muscle. It does not enter the central canal. This is an example of an abnormal orthographic pattern. This patient had been previously operated on with an anterior cervical fusion supplemented by an anterior plate. A motor vehicle accident resulted in a second injury and the patient was sent for diagnostics. In this instance, the left-sided zygopophyseal joint injection demonstrates disruption of the medial capsule with spread of contrast material into the epidural space. This is an oblique view from the left. Contrast material has filled the joint, extended through the capsule into the epidural space along the left side. Uh, here the patient is visualized from the front. The plate is seen secured in place by four screws. This is the left-sided articular process at C4, the left C5 articular process, needle entering from the anterolateral aspect on the left contrast material filling the left 4 slash 5 joint and spreading into the left-sided epidural space. 
With a subject in the lateral position, it is difficult to determine which is the upside uh, joint. By rotating the patient posteriorly, we clear the upside from the downside joint and can now focus our attention on the upsided joint here. Needle is directed toward the articular process, contacting the bone near the joint space. A minor manipulation then directs the needle into the joint. Once the needle is in the joint, injection of contrast material verifies the arthrogram. As we roll the patient posteriorly, the joint comes into view in the coronal plane. The approach to the cervical discs is quite simple. I employ a right anterolateral approach at all levels because of the tendency of the esophagus to lie just to the left of the midline in the low cervical spine. The approach is between the great vessels in the neck and the laryngotracheal apparatus. The approach is the same for virtually all levels from 2-3 to 7-1. The cervical spine viewed from anterior perspective. The C4 vertebral body, its right and left uncinate processes. The 4-5 disc, right and left uncinate processes and the uncovertebral recesses. The trachea is in the midline. Safe access to the intervertebral disc requires displacement of the trachea and major vessels in the neck. This is accomplished by applying digital pressure to the right anterior surface of the neck just medial to the sternomastoid muscle. The examining finger is directed obliquely toward the front lateral surface of the cervical spine. The resulting displacement provides safe access to the disc. This is a cross-sectional MRI scan acquired through the C4-5 disc space. Note the size and position of the laryngotracheal structures and the position of the cervical vessels. By applying digital pressure on the right anterolateral surface of the neck and pointing directly to the spine, the laryngotracheal structures are displaced away to the left and the vessels displaced posteriorly and laterally to the right, providing safe access to the anterolateral surface of the disc. The patient is in prone position. Needles are in place at C4-5 and C5-6 discs. The needles are centered to the disc space. Contrast material has been instilled, filling the nuclear region at both levels with extension into the uncovertebral recesses at both levels. Note the position of the trachea off slightly to the left. Once it is displaced and the needles put in place, the laryngotracheal structures do not return fully to the midline. On this image, we are looking at the cervical spine from right anterolateral perspective. Here is contrast material in the 4-5 disc and contrast material outlining the C5-6 disc. Root canals. Notice the normal disc, the degenerate disc at 4-5 with contrast extending through the uncinate recess and posterior longitudinal ligament into the right-sided 4-5 root canal. The segmental nerve is outlined. The needle courses along this line anterior to the expected course of the vertebral artery and segmental neural elements and posterior to the displaced laryngotracheal structures.
the needle course here and here. As seen in the lateral perspective, the needle at 4 slash 5 is centered to the disc space. The needle at 5 slash 6 in this patient is centered to the disc space and contrast fills the normal appearing nucleus. Uh, this is the uh, supine anterior posterior view of the cervical spine with the disc to be studied in the center of the field. The examiner displaces the larynx and tracheal apparatus to the left with one finger. The needle enters adjacent to the finger, is directed to the anterolateral surface of the spine, and from there into the disc. Lateral view checks position. With a fluoroscope in lateral position, proper position of the needle has been verified and contrast material can be injected into the disc. After filming in the lateral projection, the fluoroscope is returned to the vertical plane and coronal or frontal images of the disc are obtained. The final topic to be discussed is epidural injection and specifically the selective cervical epidural injection. This is the most tedious of the procedures to be performed because of the close proximity of the procedure needle to the sensitive dorsal ganglion. We have a special treat on this occasion. You'll get to see a cervical nerve block performed on me. On this posterior view myelogram mid and lower cervical spine, the dural root sleeves are outlined. Here, the C6 dural root sleeve terminates just medial to the pedicles. The length of the root canal is from the medial aspect of the pedicle laterally to the edge of the articular process. Any needle placed within the root canal outside the line of the pedicles will be in good position lateral to the thecal sac. This cross-section CT scan through the C5 vertebral body is enhanced with intravenous contrast material. Here we see the C5 body, the thecal sac, the cord, and brightly enhancing periradicular veins. There are veins in the posterior aspect of the root canal as well. Here we can identify the dorsal ganglion of C6 on the left. Note that the edge of the vertebral body and the medial edge of the zygopophyseal joint complex form a line that is immediately lateral to the edge of the thecal sac. For selective epidural injections, the course of the needle is oblique through the soft tissues to the posterior aspect of the root canal. This places the needle in close proximity to the dorsal ganglion. The cervical spine is being visualized from its right anterior oblique perspective. Here we see the C5 vertebral body, the C5 pedicle, C6 pedicle, the C5-6 root canal. This patient had, subject, had been subject to a previous fracture, dislocation, stabilized by posterior wiring. Persistence of left C6 symptoms prompted selective C6 epidural injection. The procedure needle has been directed to the lateral surface of the C6 superior articular process and after contacting bone, manipulated anterior to the process 
into the mid zone of the root canal. Note that the needle is in close proximity to the superior articular process in the posterior aspect of the root canal. In this position, the vertebral artery lies anterior to the root canal. The segmental nerve lies in the inferior aspect of the root canal just in front of the superior process and the needle. Following the installation of a small volume of contrast, in this instance less than half a cc, we can opacify the posterior aspect of the root canal. Here is the procedure needle lying in the posterior aspect of the root canal. Here is contrast material filling the posterior root canal. The indentation on the front surface of this contrast material is being made by the dorsal ganglion which lies in this position. The absence of vein filling and the clear localization of the contrast surrounding the back of the segmental nerve indicate a satisfactory injection. In this patient we are viewing the spine from the frontal perspective. Here is a C7 vertebral body, C6-7 disc space, C6 vertebral body. This is the C6 articular process, its medial edge, its lateral edge. This needle is entering from the right and lies in the mid zone of the right 5-6 root canal, immediately anterior to the C6 superior articular process. Its position in the mid zone of the canal places it lateral to the thecal sac. This spot film in the frontal plane was taken following the injection of one and a half cc's of contrast material. The contrast material can be faintly seen outlining the anterior ramus of C6 outside the, the root canal. Contrast fills the root canal and extends into the regional epidural space. The needle tip here lies lateral to the epidural space and there is no subarachnoid opacification and in this instance no vein filling. This is a very satisfactory C6 regional epidural injection. In the ideal circumstance contrast material will opacify the root canal surrounding the dorsal ganglion as seen here. There is a little bit of flow along the anterior ramus and a small amount of contrast material enters the epidural space. This patient had a right C6 posterolateral disc protrusion impressing itself on the dural root sleeve of C6 on the right. The injection resulted in complete relief of the neck and arm symptoms and allowed this patient to progress in a physical therapy program which subsequently led to pronounced relief of symptoms. Trachea in the midline, C6 vertebral body, C6 uncinate recess. Prone myelogram in this patient demonstrates irregular filling of uh, dural root sleeve on the right at C7 and on the left at C5. Symptoms were nonspecific and consistent with multilevel spondylosis and cervical epidural injection was employed. The patient is prone on the fluoroscopic table. The C7 and T1 spinous processes are identified. An epidural needle has been directed from a slightly oblique course toward the midline. Its depth has been determined by direct lateral fluoroscopy. Contact with the ligamentum flavum is established and the needle advanced slowly through the ligament using loss of resistance technique to document entry 
into the posterior epidural space. Once the epidural space has been entered, aspiration is performed, and if no blood or fluid are recovered, contrast material is instilled. This irregular pattern of contrast in the central canal is typical of epidural flow. Note contrast extending along the central canal, outlining the thecal sac, and in this instance, demonstrating some irregular mass effect on the left at C5. This final film demonstrates contrast material streaming along the dural root sleeves at C7, T1, both on the left and right, contrast being limited to the epidural space. This is a cross-sectional CT scan through the C5-6 disc space obtained following a cervical epidural injection. The lamina clearly defined, unopacified thecal sac. Surrounding the sac is contrast material filling the cervical epidural space. You can note the size of the cervical epidural space understanding that the contrast material occupies space and slightly uh, compresses the thecal sac. Normally the cervical epidural space is filled with veins. There's very little fat in this region. Cervical epidural injections require precision and care to be performed safely. The advantage of fluoroscopy is the clear demonstration of the needle tip within the epidural space documenting the flow by epidurogram. This is a frontal image of the C5-6 segment. The fluoroscope is now going to be rotated to the right to bring the right 5-6 root canal into full view. We will now put a small caudal tilt into the fluoroscope, tilting down toward the feet. The C5-6 root canal is now clearly visualized. The entry point for selective nerve block is at the lateral aspect of the C6 superior articular process. The needle has been directed down onto the lateral surface of the C6 articular process. It is now manipulated slightly anterior to the process and advanced into the mid zone of the root canal, maintaining its position immediately adjacent to the bone. The needle is now going to be manipulated just anterior to the process and advanced into the root canal. We will now move the fluoroscope to a direct frontal position to identify the position of the needle within the root canal. This is as far as the, as the needle should ever get. It is at the extreme medial aspect of the root canal. Proper position is in the mid zone of the root canal here. The root canal limits are defined by the medial aspect of the articular process here the lateral aspect of the articular process here. In this position, injection of contrast will fill the root canal. In the oblique position, contrast is seen entering the root canal and flowing from there into the central epidural space. Our patient today is a 54-year-old male, left-handed, who's had some problems recently with left low neck pain and left arm symptoms. He's had some persisting paresthesias in the distribution of C7. Uh, they've been unresponsive to conservative therapy. A CT scan has demonstrated lateral stenosis secondary to an unsnate ridge in the 6-7 root canal, and he meets all the criteria for a selective epidural injection. So after discussing the procedure fully, I'm going to go ahead and start the procedure. Okay, let's get this 
tape back there, please. Okay, get, don't hurt the shirt. Okay, now let's go ahead and start the prep right here. Well, now I've got to position this fluoroscope. I want to get it just right. Well, now let me see. This looks, well, this is just about right. Yeah, that's it, that's it. That's a good shot right there, right there. Let's hold it right there. Good. Now, let me have that needle, 25 gauge. That's good. Okay, let's see. Right here. Ah, there we go. All right. Don't move. Here it is. Uh, it sticks a little bit. Okay, just move it down onto that lateral aspect of that process. Yep, that's good. That's good. Oh, muscles are sore. Muscles are sore. Ah, it's not too bad. Okay, good. Okay, we've moved to the coronal plane. Now we need to, it's right on the process. Now I need to advance it into the root canal. So let's fluoro that and advance it right on into the mid zone of the root canal. Yep, okay. Let's take a look. look that looks good. That looks good. Okay, I'm going to put in a little contrast material now. Uh, it's hard to put this syringe on with this one hand like this. Okay, fluoro, there's go. Little contrast, excellent, excellent, excellent. You know, this really doesn't hurt that bad at all, as long as I don't stick the dorsal ganglion. This is great. Okay, good. Let's roll back up into that oblique plane and see what it looks like. Come on now, we can't keep flooring like this. Get me back on the screen in the right place. Yeah, that's better, that's better. Okay, move it up. Let's take a look again now. Okay. That looks pretty good. Now we go ahead and put in the physiologic solutions. We're going to be using, uh, Garrett, what are we using in this? We're using three quarters of a cc of Celestone with one cc of 1% lidocaine, Charlie. Good, okay. All right, let's far out. There it goes. Oh, that's feeling funny down the arm. That's feeling strange down the arm. Whoa. Oh, it's tolerable, but it feels weird. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Okay, that's good. I think it's the pressure makes it feel like that. It's all gone now, except I've got the little tingling from the anesthetic. Feels good. Yeah, that, that looks like about right. I think I'll go ahead and take the needle out now. That's good. We're done. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take that out now. Okay, here it is. I'm going to take it out. Okay, that's it. Good. All right, somebody hand me a little piece of gauze here for this. Uh, hope it didn't stain my shirt. Well, this concludes our second uh, procedure videotape. Uh, I hope this was enjoyable, and I hope it provides some useful information that will help you in your practice. And remember, with regard to these self-administered cervical nerve blocks, we're trained professionals. Don't do this at home. seen was real. The hands were changed to protect the patient.